On episode 219 of The Anxious Truth, we're going to ask a question. Can prolonged anxiety hurt you physically? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of this fine podcast. The Anxious Truth is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and recovery. If you are new to the podcast or to the YouTube channel, just stumbling in for the first time today, welcome. I'm glad you're here, and I hope you find the material useful. If you are a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. Thank you for your continued attention and support. I appreciate you guys. This is episode 219 of the podcast. We're recording early August of 2022. In case you're listening in the future, you know where I was at the time. Uh, today, we are asking a question. We're going to ad- address a very common question that's on many people's minds in the community, and that is, can prolonged anxiety, always being in this state of anxiety and fear for so long, hurt me physically? Can it damage my body? And a little spoiler alert before we do my little preamble and we get into the actual episode. The spoiler alert is, maybe. <laughs> I can't give you a definitive answer one way or the other because we just don't have one now. All right, so keep that in mind. We're going to talk about the nature of the question, the nature of the answer, and why it's asked, and, and how to consume information to try and answer it, and what you can do about this. But before I do, I have to remind you that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There are 200 and somewhat other totally free podcast episodes. There's the free newsletter that I write every morning, uh, four days every week. It's also a mini podcast. There is uh, tons and tons of free social media content. Uh, There are three, as of this date, uh, books on anxiety and anxiety disorders and recovery that I have written that are literally helping tens of thousands of people around the world. All of those things and more goodies that are coming soon can be found on my website at theanxioustruth.com. That's theanxioustruth.com. Go check it out. It's all there. So avail yourself of the resources. And if you are enjoying my work and I'm helping you in some way, and you would like to find a way to help me keep it free of advertising and promotion and sponsorships, uh, all the ways to do that can be found on my website at theanxioustruth.com slash support. All the ways to support the worker there. It is never required, but always appreciated. I appreciate all the support you guys give me in whatever form it happens to be. So thank you so much for all of that. So let's get into this. The question is, can prolonged anxiety, being anxious and afraid all the time, for a long time, hurt me physically? Will it damage my body? Now, this is a question that most people in our community will ask, at least sometimes for some of you, it becomes the primary driver of your anxiety. Uh, A lot of people become completely fixated and obsessed by this worry uh, to the point where it is the primary source of fear. So regardless of which camp you're in, whether it's something you think about now and then or whether you are crippled by this fear today while you are listening, this episode is geared for you. A couple things I want to talk about. Um... I think we need to look at the context that the question exists in. And the context that it exists in in 2022 is certainly different than the context that would have existed in 1970 or even 1990, like before the advent of the internet. So the internet has changed a lot of things for us. It has certainly changed how we consume information and it has changed the amount of information that it has available, that is available to us at our fingertips at a moment's notice. So an anxious person that is really worried that anxiety is going to somehow damage their heart or give them cancer or cause an autoimmune disease can literally pick up any device, any number of devices that they probably own, at least in the West, uh, and immediately begin to ask that question at Google and just get buried in responses. But the responses are going to really vary very widely, and it depends on where you go. So before I decided to do this episode, I said, well, you know what, let me spend some time. And I put aside about six or seven hours and I did a bunch of research on this topic because I wanted to make sure I was pretty current with what's going on. I want to give you good information. And I can tell you that there is a vast difference in the answer to this question, will anxiety hurt me physically if it's prolonged, depending on where you ask that question. So if I just go to Google and I type that in, I get a avalanche of responses, right? I get an avalanche of responses. Google knows me and it knows my habits, but even knowing me and who I am and my search habits and the sites I tend to visit, I am buried in sites that don't necessarily have the mission of giving me scholarly information or peer-reviewed information or direct data. They're in the business of trying to get my attention. Now, I'm not picking on the internet, even though I am a little bit. The internet is a great thing and it has changed the world, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. But In the end, you have to realize that the internet is not designed, by and large, to give you the most accurate 
or applicable information. The internet in 2022 is essentially designed to keep your attention. So when you get sites like WebMD, which are, you know, uh, you know, Healthline and those kind of sites, uh, wellness sites, you know, healthcare site, alternative healing sites, those sites are not necessarily designed. Yeah, sure. They want to help you. They want to give you information. I'm not saying they don't, but they're also really designed to keep your attention and get your attention. So my Google search results, even mine, even mine are really skewed heavily toward like, oh my God, this looks like I'm screwed. Like, look at all these little blurbs for all these sites that, that are telling me that, yeah, there's a link. Oh my God, there's a link. There's a link. There's a link. So if you look at the Google results for that question, you can very quickly be overwhelmed, especially it, given your anxious state right now, where you are seeing everything as doom, like everything is interpreted through that fearful, anxious, distorted disaster lens. You can quickly look and say, oh my God, yes, it's going to kill me. No doubt about it. It's going to kill me. But when I say, okay, let me look at these results. Now, let me use other resources. So now I'm going to go to Google Scholar. Now, you will not find WebMD results. You will not find Healthline results in Google Scholar. You will only find research papers. And I'm going to ask the question in Google Scholar. And then I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have access to my university library in my grad program, which is connected to scholarly databases all over the world. And I'm going to ask the question there. I can tell you that I get very different results and draw very different conclusions when I go there. That is important. That is important. Keep in mind that when you are trying to find definitive proof that your anxiety will not harm your body because you're terrified that it will, you are going to generally be led in the opposite direction. Look at all these articles that you should click on to learn why it's hurting you. But really, they should say, well, here's a bunch of articles that tell you that there's a link between being anxious, depressed, and some physical problems, but we don't know if one causes the other. But that's not so exciting, so you're not generally going to click on those. You're going to click on the one that sort of gives you the hint that, like, I have the answer. Come here. I have the answer, says WebMD. I have the answer, says some healing or alternative medicine site. I have the answer. Click on me. Whereas Google Scholar, <laughs> Nobody cares. Click on me. Don't click on me. Doesn't matter. You know, the research that I can do through my university library doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Like, click on me. Don't click on me. Doesn't matter. You're paying for the library anyway, right? It really changes the results that you get. So here's what I know. In, this is not two years worth of exhaustive research. This is about seven, I guess probably say seven, seven and a half hours that I spent going through some papers. And I probably went through you know, in one form or other, about 20 papers or so. You can't do hundreds of them in seven hours. You just can't do it if, you, if you're reading, like, truthfully. So here is what I know. We can't answer the question definitively. What we can say is there does not seem to be any debate that there is certainly overlap, comorbidity. These things exist together, right? Especially depression. Depression seems to be studied more than anxiety disorders. But, you know, there's more study being done in anxiety disorders, which is good. But we can certainly say, and nobody seems to be debating this, that there is a link of some kind, right? So if you are dealing with a depression or anxiety disorders, you are more likely to also be dealing with health problems. That's true. But the other is also true. From the flip side, if you are dealing with health conditions, you are more likely to also develop anxiety and depression. So uh, you know, at first glance, and when the internet is allowed to sensationalize that for the purpose of getting your attention, right, and nobody watches the news for good news, people watch the news because so I want to hear what the dangers are in the world, same thing applies with research on the internet, the internet will sort of wash that in this like, there is a link, and we will imply that that one causes the other. But in any of the research, when you go through that, you will see time and time again, we don't have a causal link here, we have correlation, we have comorbidity. We have coexistence. We, we can guess at what might be causing this, but we don't have a clear path that says that being in an anxious state damages your heart. We don't know that. And interestingly, let's take it as an example. I don't want to get too deep into it. You guys can try and do the research yourself. I'm not going to bore you with all the data. But when you look at research into the comorbidity between anxiety, depression, and cardiovascular disease, right? Cardiovascular disease, biggest single cause of death in the U.S., that's true. But when you look at the link between depression, anxiety, and cardiovascular disease, what a very large percentage of that study is based on people who are post-MI, myocardial infarction, people who have already suffered a heart attack, 
right? So now you could kind of adjust and try and control for like, well, did you have panic attacks before the heart attack? But sometimes that data just isn't there because nobody thought to look for it. But a large portion of the study done on, on the link between, say, heart attack, cardiovascular disease, and anxiety and depression comes in populations of people who have already suffered a heart attack. So you got to keep that in mind, right? That really changes the color of that data. I'm not trying to dismiss it. I'm not saying this is a thing that we should not be concerned about and look at. I'm not saying that at all. That would be disingenuous of me. So I'm not dismissing your fear or saying it's ridiculous. Don't think about that. I'm not saying that at all. We could be concerned about it. We could think about that. But consider that. So when you are completely sure that the internet, because WebMD and some healing site or some alternative health site or health line that wants to get your attention has convinced you that being anxious wears out your heart somehow, I can tell you that when you look at the data that is underneath those articles that they sometimes cite and sometimes don't, you won't see that at all. You will see like, well, people who suffer heart attacks often develop depression and along with that come elevated anxiety symptoms or even the development of anxiety disorders. Like that's a very different result, isn't it? You know, but nonetheless, we don't say that. You won't find some of those sites say, oh, by the way, this was in a population of people who have already suffered a heart attack or multiple heart attacks. They, won't, they don't tell you that part. So I'm not saying that all of the research is just post-heart attack. That's not true. Uh, don't, don't at me. Uh, but I'm saying when you look at that nuance, which you have to, it really paints things in a very different picture, right? And the same thing holds true. I've seen research. I went through research that, that looked at the link between anxiety, really depression and anxiety and IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, epidemiologically, yes, it looks like there's a link. Asthma looks like there's a link. Believe it or not, looks like there is a, an epidemiological link. There is some comorbidity there, some coexistence, some overlap between people who have asthma and people who have depression or experience anxiety or have anxiety disorders. Like asthma, I wasn't expecting to find that. And interestingly, one of the papers that I went through said, oh, look, the more asthmatic related, asthma related adverse events a person has, the more likely they are to develop an anxiety disorder or start to experience depression. See the difference there? So you might look and say like, oh my God, there's a link between anxiety and asthma. Yeah, but the link was the other way. And as so there are people that are trying to find some physiological basis. Is anxiety causing asthma? Or does the asthma cause anxiety? There are people looking at that, and I'm glad that they are. They should. But you see how that looks very different? Like, oh, if you have asthma, the more you struggle with your asthma, the more likely you are to be anxious and maybe develop depression, which wouldn't be news to anybody. But in the mainstream, if you, I don't want to be mainstream media guy. I'm not that guy. I'm not a conspiracy guy. But if you just did a Google search, you would possibly be led to believe, especially if you're already afraid and looking for confirmation of the disaster, that anxiety causes asthma. doesn't do that. There's nothing that says that. Um, the link between anxiety and cancer has been studied. The link between anxiety and cardiovascular disease has been studied. There's a lot of things like common issues here. Um, IBS. Same thing. That's another thing that's been studied quite a bit. Yeah, there's a link. There's, there's links. We just don't know what the links are, which direction they are in. And every good study will point out the fact that there's like a bazillion variables there that you can't control for all of them, especially if they're doing long-term data review, they're doing literature review. Like it's hard to do a specific study on that. You can't really do experiments on that. All you can do is review data. And some of the data isn't necessarily clear, wasn't organized properly, didn't collect all the variables you need for the study. So all the research that's reputable and reviewed will say like, hey, there's a ton of variables here. We have to account for genetics. We have to account for environment. We have to account for diet. We have to account for lifestyle. We have to account for external stressors like socioeconomic stressors or relationships. We have to account for things like drug use, alcohol use. There's so many variables that go into this. So we can't say definitively that the anxiety causes this. We just can't. So the quick answer to the question, isn't this hurting my body, is I don't know. <laughs> you know, I know you don't like it. I know you're really worried about that. But we do not see a specific link right now that says, yeah, there's a direct path. I know people are going to come at me with things like heart rate variability. Yeah, heart rate variability has turned out to be a thing. It seems to be a measure of sympathetic nervous system activation. That's 100% true. But that does not, you cannot make the leap between that and C, it's hurting my heart because we don't know that. There's research out there that cites HRV, right? Starts to understand that like, oh yeah, the variability in the way your heartbeat is, so does seem to be an indicator of stress levels and say cardiac efficiency, some people will want to say. 
I'm no cardiologist. I'm not claiming to, to be a doctor here. But when you look at that research and you read it and you say, oh, there's not really a link here. It's just, HRV is descriptive, not predictive at this point. Big difference, okay? So the other thing that I want to talk about when it comes to this question is, number one, there is no definitive answer, but there's also no proof right now that you can point to that says, oh, here is the absolute, the science says that this anxious state will destroy my heart. It does not say that. But I also want to talk about two other things. First of all, I want to address the adverse childhood event study, the ACE study, because a lot of people, you will go to that. And the ACE study, you can look that up, adverse childhood experiences. It was a Kaiser Permanente study that was done years ago. It's, it's really kind of groundbreaking research. It really is. And it did illustrate a lot of really important things that we need to look at more. Uh, and especially in the trauma treatment and trauma resolution community, that ACE study holds a lot of sway, and it should. Right, so the ACE study says that there is a correlation between people who stu- who suffer through a large number of adverse childhood experiences or events, and people who develop specific health problems later on in life, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, addiction, all those things. So yeah, that's out there, hundred percent. And like, there seems to be a link here. There's a link between you know living a difficult childhood and having these these legit heart uh, not, uh, health conditions later on. That's true, um, and that's an important study. It's a good study. It opened the door to a lot of good conversation, a lot of other research, and a lot of different dialogue that needs to be had. So I am a fan of the study, but sometimes people take that study and say, see, it says that trauma causes diabetes. I've literally had people say that to me. Did you see the ACE study? Trauma causes diabetes. But even the people who did the study, who even to this day are talking about it, will tell you flat out, please don't read it that way. That's not what it says. It says there is a link. There is an increased risk for these things. So yes, the, the, you know, those experiences cre- increase your risk for developing these things, but we don't know why. We can't say it causes it. And please keep this in mind, anxious person that, that doesn't understand or really is having a hard time assessing risk right now. Everything is a, is a risk to you greater than it is to me. Risk does not mean guarantee. It does not mean that, Right. So I know, especially if you have health anxiety, your ability to accurately assess risk and plug risk variables into like your life equations is off the rails. It's totally out of whack right now. You will take, you know, oh, a 0.01% risk and turn that into 90% risk. So when you hear that people who are dealing with these adverse childhood experiences, people who live trauma are at increased risk of, people who are depressed for a long period of time are increased risk of, you may read, it causes it. It is a guarantee. It is not a guarantee. It increases risk. And we honestly do not understand why very clearly right now. Uh, is it because of different changes in lifestyle? People who study depression and these, and these uh, health conditions will tell you flat out, like, well, we know that in depression, there's a change in self-care and the way people manage their health. And that sort of degrades. And that seems to lead to this. We don't know. We don't know. So please be very careful about going on the internet and deciding the internet said that my anxiety is ruining my heart. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. And risk does not mean guarantee and correlation is not causation. Now, here's another really important thing that I want to kind of wrap this up with, spend minutes, a few minutes on this. Consider a situation where maybe you are worried about this anxiety, and we're talking about anxiety disorders here, right? We're not just worrying about life anxiety. We're talking about anxiety disorders. I'm worried that being in an anxious state all the time will impact my health down the road. I'm ruining my body by doing this, by being in this state. Consider the difference between somebody who is a prisoner of war or is incarcerated or is stuck in an abusive relationship or a child or anybody who's living with food insecurity, shelter insecurity, socioeconomic pressure, like systemic problems, those are external things. Those people in those situations didn't ask for those things. You don't get to wave a magic wand. Sometimes you unfortunately have limited agency, power, and influence in changing those things. You need help from the outside world sometimes, from people outside of your own skin. That's true. But, but an anxiety disorder is not that. It's not that. So consider the possibility that you were sitting on the sofa right now listening to this podcast worried sick about the fact that your worrying will cause a health problem later on, 
which makes you even more anxious, which makes you worry more about this problem. You see the cycle? And that is internally generated. And I want you to consider the possibility that when you ruminate on this and you worry and you overthink and you try to predict the future and you stay perfectly still because you are convinced that your heart, your liver, and every other part of your body is made of glass and you can't handle this, you are almost choosing to create the situation that you fear. See, see the issue here? If I am stuck in a situation that is beyond my control and it is stressing me and I am in an anxious state all the time because I am fearful for my own safety, my life, my whatever, my existence, then yeah, I'd be like, how am I going to get out of this? This is killing me, maybe. Uh, and how do I get even to get out of this? But when you are in a situation where it is not out of your control, you do have some agency, you do have influence, you have power in this process, choosing to just worry about it and then be take no action to address the thing that you think is going to cause a problem would seem crazy. I'm not calling anybody crazy here. I'm just trying to be brutally honest about this. You know, consider the, that worrying about getting cancer could be just as stressful as getting cancer. So I'm super worried that my anxiety will, will cause me to get cancer, which makes me worry as if I have cancer. I'm super worried that my anxiety is stressing my heart, and that worry makes me afraid, which makes my heart beat faster. Except that that worry is a thing that you can address because it's internally generated. Right? So really the answer to, is this anxiety going to hurt me down the road, is, well, what can I do to get out of this relationship with the anxiety so I don't have to ask this question again in six months or eight months or two years? Like, it's super important to not just ask the question, hope to get the answer that makes you feel better, and then say, okay, I guess I'll be okay, and I can remain this way for the rest of my life. Or, oh my God, I feel like this is going to kill me in two years. What can I do? Well, you can do things. Like, I would not talk into this silly microphone every week if I did not believe that you can do things to change your circumstances. So I think it's just as important to understand that this is internally generated anxiety, fear, and worry that we're addressing here on this podcast. I'm not invalidating anybody who's living in an abusive situation, who has legitimate life stress, legit health problems that are causing emotional issues. I'm not invalidating that at all. I am simply addressing the state of disordered anxiety, which is internally generated and over which we do get to exert some influence, some agency, some power. I'm not going to use the word control because it implies you just turn a switch off. You can't do that. But there are actions we could take to change our relationship with that anxiety so that it doesn't become a disaster for us. And then we have to worry that it's a monster that will kill us by tearing our heart to bits down the road. So consider that there is really an important second part of that question. Can this prolonged anxiety hurt me physically? And beyond that, what can I do to not prolong it anymore? in this disordered state. Really important. If you don't really continue and ask the second part of that question, then the first part of the question can just play in a loop forever, forever. Right? So I, and I do understand the self-perpetuating nature of that. Many people will say, I am worried sick that I am damaging my heart. So therefore, I'm trying to do everything I can to not overwork my heart, which means I won't do exposures. I won't get off the sofa. I won't bend down to tie my shoes. I won't climb the stairs. Because I've already decided that I'm hurting my heart, so therefore I will be inactive and just let just worry, which then makes my heart beat any fast, makes my heart beat faster, and the cycle continues. It's very typical with cardiophobia, right? Yet we all know that if somebody went out right now, if you saw somebody that was doing three hours of cardiovascular exercise, everybody would be like, man, that person is super healthy. So you have to recognize the situation that you're in and the con your own personal context. That this question, will this prolonged anxiety hurt me physically, exists in. It exists in your own personal context that doesn't have to remain what it is. Right? I'm never saying it's easy. You don't get to just change your mind and fix your anxiety. There's no fast cure. There's no magic wand. I don't have magic words to make it go away. But we do know that these disorders that we address are the most, the most treatable mental health problems we have in the Western world. You can address this. So there's no reason to just sit passively and worry for the next two years whether or not you're damaging your body. You can control whether or not the state you fear is damaging or you can influence that state and change it over time with work and effort, okay? So I will wrap it up there. 
Um, I just think it's super important to understand the lens you're looking through, which is a fearful lens, understand that you have to be a little bit more critical consumer of information when you're trying to answer, answer sort of loaded questions like this. Understand that there is no causal link right now because correlation does not equal causation. Understand that increased risk does not mean a guarantee that a thing will happen. It only means increased risk, which is based on a huge number of variables that more, most of which we don't probably know right now. And understand that you can actually do something about the situation you are afraid is going to harm you. Those are the, those are the points. There you go. Those will be the show notes. Uh, anyway, it, so that is episode 219. I'll wrap it up here. I don't want to go much longer than this. This is a little longer than I like to do even these days. So that's it. 219 in the books. You know it's over because music. Uh, if you want to check the show notes on this episode, and I try my best to do detailed show notes, you can always go to theanxioustruth.com slash 219, where you can kind of read an article based on this podcast. Uh, if you are listening to the podcast on iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, and you can rate or review the podcast, do me a favor, leave a five-star rating if you're digging it. And if you have a minute or two, write a review because it helps other people find the podcast. And I kind of do this to help as many people as I can. If you're watching on YouTube or listening, as the case may be, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, right? Is that what I'm supposed to say as a YouTube influencer? <laughs> so you know when I upload, leave a comment. YouTube is great for comments. I'm digging interacting with you guys these days. Um, I appreciate that. That's one good way to support the work that I do uh, is to just sort of help it get noticed a little bit more. The song you're listening to is called Afterglow. It was written by Ben Drake. Uh, he wrote it a few years ago, inspired in part by words he heard in this podcast, and he's been gracious enough to let me use the song for the last couple of years. It's what you hear at the beginning and the end of every show. If you want to find Ben and his music, you can do that at bendrakemusic.com. Go check him out. Tell him I said hello. And that is it. 219 in the books. I will be back next week talking about something. I don't know what it's going to be, but I will be here. So see you next week. And remember, as always, this is the way. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance. So go and live your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push through the pressure like an atom bomb. You keep on dancing like it's your life.